So if you're like me, you're probably just absolutely fiending for any additional things about Diablo 4 that we can possibly sink our teeth into that's actually substantive. And luckily, the Diablo team just released this video into the end game where they're describing some of the end game systems that they have up until now not really given a ton of detail into. And if I'm being honest, in this video, they also don't give an exceptional amount of detail, but there was a lot of stuff that I was able to pick out while watching it. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and play the video free now. Obviously, we're going to be jump cutting between a couple things. And I want to try to point out these little bitty details that I saw that I think speak to much bigger things that we should expect and what kind of expectations we can have walking into when the game releases. So let's go ahead and get into it right off the bat. Just without question, right off the bat there, we get Indariel. That's Indariel. Now, I know a lot of people were able to go see things and achievements, and if they played during the beta, they were able to go check like quest achievements and stuff like that. If you were like me uh, and you didn't go look through all of those different menus, uh, just in case you didn't want to ruin anything, this is the first time that I'm like straight up seeing Indariel in the game. That is fantastic. I love the model. That's super cool. It also lends me to believe that I'm probably going to be seeing a ton of return faces. Obviously, that's nothing new in the Diablo series, but I figured this small little clip where you see her very quickly was good to point out. So already in this one still of the Paragon board, we've gained a ton of information that I think is not necessarily representative of exactly what it will look like. I assume that this information is from an earlier build of the game, just because we already know that the beta that we participated in was also an earlier build of the game. But let's look at a couple things here, just so you can kind of help to wrap your mind around it. In the game, Paragon board is going to have these little gates where you have to connect from one board to another board, and then each basic node is going to give you plus five to main stats. So we see the fist punching into the air. This is a strength node. This is going to give you plus five to your strength. This looks like a dexterity node. Then you have an intelligence node. I assume you also have a willpower node somewhere else in here, if I were to just look very quickly, and this probably your willpower node. If each one of these nodes is giving you plus five to a basic stat, and then what I can only assume are more interesting nodes that have different icons here, which are your magic nodes, and then you have your rare nodes that have this like clear electrified uh, little decal around it. So I assume those are even more powerful that have something to do with the magic nodes around them. Then you have a node that looks like you'd be able to socket any one of these glyphs in. Looks like this glyph is already activated somewhere. Again, we have magic colored glyphs and then rare colored glyphs as well. And then you also have these big nodes here, which you can only barely see right here, which is actually orange or what I assume is a legendary node. I believe that this one here, again, with more of that kind of deeper orange and yellow color around it, as opposed to this base yellow color, it's probably a legendary node as well. And from what I can see, one, two, three, four, five, six rare nodes. Each node has a one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, just double checking five magic nodes around it, and then the legendary node, which you notice doesn't have any particular nodes around it, and then the socket as well. So that's the basic construction of this. Each one of the gates between your nodes are also indicated like these rare nodes, so they probably are giving you more stats. But there's a couple kind of uh, potentially concerning things that I see here. The character has 148 available points, and if they only have these three boards, which I've looked at and kind of tried to figure out what the base structure of them is, it looks like they spent somewhere around 50-ish points. If you just kind of go through and do the little simple geometric math here, they probably spent somewhere around 50 points. So I assume this is a level 100 character. So if the refund cost is 53,666 gold, and this person has already committed about 50 points here, 53,000 times 50 points for a total refund cost puts you at 2.5 million gold to respect their current Paragon board. And that's with theoretically a quarter of the total amount of nodes that you have put into it. So at Skill point 200, if we assume it's completely linear, that means it's 10 million gold to completely respec your Paragon board. Now, I just want to point out this is almost certainly from a prior build. We know that the most recent beta that we played in was already an older version of the game than is currently in development. These prices might look drastically different, but this is the only thing that we really have to go off of as definitive proof of the current cost expected at level 100. So again, character has 4.1 million gold, it would take 2.5 million gold for them to respec about 50-ish points that they already have available to them. 
And if you were to spend all of them, and again, it's linear, we're talking about 10 million gold to be able to respec your Paragon board. Now, that number is probably pretty scary. We can't really assume how much gold you're able to generate per hour playing on a character, but at least wanted to try to point that out as a potential range for what we could be expecting. So in the very next frame side of my speculation, we do get a look at a legendary node. So this one here, cheap shot, you deal 5% increased damage for each nearby enemy that is crowd controlled up to 25%. Legendary node of just giving you 25% increased base damage based off of having a lot of crowd controlled enemies in your surroundings is already pretty cool and a vast difference between that and just gaining plus five to base stats. You'll notice that the refund cost is still at that 53,666. So I'm again going to assume that we're talking about a character who is at max level 100. And it doesn't look like getting into any of these legendary nodes costs more or less Paragon points than any of the base ones. To very quickly point it out, because we're finally getting a look at one of the magic nodes that are in this area, this is magic node that just for the one point is gaining you plus 50 armor. Armor is a lot more important than Diablo 4 than you would typically expect it to be. This is basically just flat damage reduction across the board. The way for you and then that second node that we saw for just a moment points to They're really a way plus seven strength. So the magic version of the same symbol that you find in the rest of the Paragon board is an upgraded version of it. I don't think that any of the rare or legendary nodes will be an instance of this, because from what I can see in any one of these, if you zoom in, they all very unique looking icons as opposed to just a blue covering over the same hand or head cog wheels, the two hands with the dagger or the Zen like person, which represents willpower. Nightmare Dungeons are going to give the players the opportunity to experience a dungeon that they might have already experienced in their past playthroughs. They'll enter the dungeon with a found sigil that alters the playstyle and the intensity of the dungeon. They're more difficult and they have additional objectives and then they also have affixes which add a degree of difficulty for you and your group to work through. So as the game producer just said, there are a couple things to know about Nightmare Dungeons that they didn't necessarily go into incredible detail, but just wanted to point out there. So Nightmare Dungeons are inherently more difficult, if that makes sense. They will have additional objectives, which is kind of interesting. I know that sometimes while running dungeons, I would run into an area where, I don't know, there were bandits attacking a person, I need to rescue them. So this might be what they're talking about, additional objectives, where the reward will be a chest with either items in it or obols, something to that degree. But the fact that the Nightmare Dungeons themselves are also expected to always have additional objectives is kind of interesting. They then also talk about the fact that they will gain affixes. Now, this is what we already understand from what the Nightmare Sigils had as their little pop up in game when you hovered over them. But the idea is that you will gain additional benefits as well as additional difficulties and challenges when walking into it. I noticed that there was this little flying topics. thing right I mean, here. Not exactly sure difficulty. what that is, but this little flying thing that isn't a skill that I've seen a character have. I assume that this is one of the things that is uh, affecting the dungeon or perhaps uh, empowering monsters or weakening the player in some way. But this is what you can expect. Unique changes to the dungeon clearing experience. And the other thing to kind of understand about Nightmare Dungeons is that unlike what we were doing in the beta, where we were just kind of running the beginning of the dungeon because they front loaded it with a ton of elite monsters, and we were just getting a lot of loot, you will need to complete a Nightmare Dungeon, meaning you'll need to be able to go through the first and second part and then defeat the boss. So you can level up your sigils. Those were the things that we were seeing in the Paragon board earlier. Be able to level those up you need to be able to defeat the actual nightmare dungeon boss so when you're walking into game release don't expect to just be running the beginning of nightmare dungeons because while you will get loot you can get loot anywhere in the game whereas defeating the nightmare boss is going to be required to unlock your last portion of progression which are these glyphs which will get socketed into your boards and if we know that glyphs are only empowered by finishing a nightmare dungeon and realistically the nightmare dungeon is probably the most important gameplay loop at the end game for a character then unlocking your boards to be able to insert as many glyphs as possible it's probably going to be one of the major prioritizations for scaling out the most powerful characters so that lets us infer a little bit more about the paragon system and just how important each node is in comparison to unlocking the free nodes to put your glyphs 
glyphs in. My favorite affixes that you can find at your dungeons is actually called Hellgate. Occasionally, these portals will open up. Okay, so this one right here is just actually very cool. I just think this is sick. That region for you to also be dealing with while you're trying to handle everything else inside the dungeon. One of the things I saw people talking about was that like each monster was kind of the samey attacks didn't matter. It really didn't matter. One, I just like to remind people that we were talking about the veteran difficulty up to level 25 experience in the first act of the game. And that I personally thought that each monster individually fought incredibly differently, had much different stats. I could interact with them in different ways, whether or not I could death blow them at half life versus quarter life or just straight off the jump which would allow me to play my Barbarian differently. I actually thought that the monster variety was an incredibly strong point of combat in Diablo 4. And I love this thing, which is, as Joe Purpura just said, literally dropping in different monster types into a dungeon that you might not have specialized for. Even in the beta, I was making decisions between which dungeons to run. While the big goat men and Anika's Claim are typically doing more damage, the vampires and the ghouls in Dead Man's Dredge were more flighty, you know, ran away from combat more often and had a lot of life drain capabilities, so I need to be able to output damage more quickly. I was making decisions based off my gear, my skills, and my rotation to be able to capitalize on the different strengths and weaknesses of monsters. So I like the idea of walking into a dungeon where you're expecting to be fighting a bunch of slow, heavy-hitting, easy-to-CC monsters, and all of a sudden they drop a ton of vampires, vampire bats, and the ghoul lords in, and all of a sudden you got them zipping all around the fight. I'm not saying it's going to like absolutely revolutionize the game, but I am excited to see what that type of additional difficulty does. And then just as like a quick note, I assume most dungeons are going to have fairly equitable density of monsters. But if you have an affix that literally says just spawn in more monsters, unless it's like Diablo 2, where resurrected or spawned in monsters don't drop loot or XP, which I highly doubt, having this affix on your elite dungeon theoretically means you just get more loot per dungeon to collect. So maybe keep your eye out on that affix as a really desirable one in the end game farming strategy. I'm at least going to try to tap into that. The force of hell are starting to have more influence in certain parts of Sanctuary in the vast interconnected overworld of the experience. And as the players are going into Helltide areas, you're gonna find even more powerful monsters. So they just gave us a little bit of insight into Helltide and I'll let the rest of it play out, but this is sounding incredibly similar to Terror Zones in Diablo 2 Resurrected. I'm almost wondering if the D2 team, when they implemented this into D2R, were taking some inspiration from the D4 team here or vice versa, but it sounds like areas in the open world will literally just become stronger and harder. This might mean that they potentially scale up higher than the character, which would be my hope, considering that's one of the few ways to make things more challenging in a significant way. By killing them, they'll be able to gain these special shards they can take to go and use to purchase these big rewards that are available, these caches that are found literally throughout Helltide areas. So the Helltide area isn't just more challenging monsters, and again, if my dream comes true, higher scaled monsters, but also you'll be receiving some type of currency which is used to open up chests inside of the Helltide area. And as you notice, just in that small little so clip there, I'll let it play <laughs> back out, we see a bunch of health orbs come out, a ton of gold, a rare uh, that looks like Fiend Rose, if I can already tell the different <laughs> materials on the ground, uh, which is just one of the rare materials that if you hovered over it said only drop in Helltide events. And then here we have a legendary item with a little bit of an additional kind of big oomph around it. I'm wondering if this is indicative of ancestral or sacred, but this is a cache that opened up with gold, a rare material, and then a legendary item for you to get. If I'm not mistaken, I didn't necessarily see what thing you are collecting. Hold on, let's try to pick up on it. More powerful monsters. And by killing them, they'll be uh, this thing right here, if you look on this part of the area before all of these uh, spell effects go over it, and then if you check out, yeah, right there as well. So there's just a very small glowing thing on the ground, which is what I assume you actually pick up to be able to unlock these chests. Yeah, so again, you see it right there. When that monster dies, one comes out of their corpse. So it looks like each monster is going to be dropping some small material that you pick up. And then again, you'll have to hit some amount to be able to go open up these chests in the Helltide area itself. The other cool part about that is theoretically those chests are either visible to everybody or are singular, meaning that there will be one in an area. So it might be a little bit of competition between players or since everything else is instanced, each chest will be individual to that person. 
They don't really touch on it here, but that's just another thing to keep in mind. I'm pretty sure the Whispers of the Dead and the Tree of Whispers are a completely separate, um, like standalone endgame activity, which Ash will go on to explain in just a little bit more detail here. It is grim and a little gruesome, but it's also something mystically haunting. And also, shout out to this art. The it's like absolutely beautiful. A, bit of a grudge against our players, and it would like for them to go serve. It's me. So we have an example of one of these Tree of Whisper bounties. There was a seller. So this is probably one of the reasons why you might be wondering why are all of these sellers all around, but they want you to go complete a specific seller. When you did, you get Whisper Silenced plus one. Looks kind of like the spooky tree. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it looks like you'll have to complete ten of these missions. And this was on a level 75 character. I want to try to pick up another detail that I saw a little bit later on. But just to get a better understanding of just how much XP and gold these things are worth, I just want to point out those two little details there. So again, this area, the Tree of Whispers, a level 50 area, a uh, pretty small little area right here. Yes, that was the icon that we saw. And again, it's the same character as level 75. Maybe you're going to go to the Fractured Peaks and take out some weapons. And then let's just look at that for another second. Choose your reward, a collection of one-handed weapons, a collection of boots, or a collection of gauntlets. Uh, so pretty targeted rewards, a choice of one of three. I assume this is going to rotate through the different things that you could get and then theoretically pop one of these open and it just dumps a bunch of different gauntlets on you, basically generating a lot of gear. I assume according to your character level as if a monster dropped it, uh, that could be potentially of any rarity. Maybe you're going to go to the Fractured Peaks and take out some werewolves that are rampaging in the town. This was something I also wanted to touch on because I believe that what we're looking at right now is a PvP zone. And if you can't see it, just out right up here, you see PvP event. You see what those uh, those Shards of Hatred were, uh, which were a currency that we could hover over, but we didn't actually have ourselves. We're in the Brittle Ruins. This area is a level 50 zone and every character. Well, you have Magical Mike down here is level 100, but we have a level 75 Barbarian here and then a level 50 Rogue, I assume. Tamed activities that you can and they are fighting one. some really larger monster. Paper. It's one of the Khazra Abominations there. But more so, the reason why I point that out is because if we are in a PvP zone, but we are in a group, that does point to one of the things I know that people have been talking about, which is this concept of how easy or difficult will it be to participate in PvP, especially if you can group up as opposed to being a solo player. Now, this does say PvP event, so maybe you're only able to group up for events themselves. I don't think that would be the case, but I also just find it interesting that we're clearly looking at some PvP zone material right here, and the only thing that we see is players together in a group fighting what look like basic monsters as opposed to necessarily fighting other players. So maybe we'll get to see a little bit more of that a little bit later on. You can do alone or in a group. We really wanted to create variety for people to be able to spend time where they wanted to in the world. It's very cool the way it's been. So there we had a level 75 character who completed the Tree of Whispers. They got 144,000 experience. That means 144,000 XP is what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Like somewhere around 1% of what you would need to hit the next level, I'm going to assume they just leveled up from this instead of assuming that that's just how little XP they got from it. In Diablo 4, we have a focus on the world of Sanctuary, and there are parts of that world that we call the Fields of Hatred, where Lilith's presence in Sanctuary has begun to seep through and manifest these poisonous areas. So here we're actually seeing the PvP, players go to these Fields of Hatred. To engage in player versus player conflict. These offer opportunities for the player to collect shards. Look at that. We had a necromancer versus, versus a wizard versus a druid. That's what I like to see. Player to collect shards. But there is a little bit of shards pop out of monsters in PvP zones. Also, hold on, I just wanted to see right here. These offer opportunities for the player to collect shards. So this player just activated what looks like Okay, so there's actually there's actually a ton of stuff for me to talk about here now that I look at it. Uh, so we have an ore vein in the PvP area, and if you look really closely, uh, it looks like this necromancer actually activated the ore vein there, and the shards popped out. So shards are popping out of poppables inside of PvP zones. 
but there is a little we bit also get shards and gold popping out of one of these Kazra abominations again players who i assume are in a group but we don't have the ui in anymore order to get these shards back to town you will need to purify them other players will definitely know that you're attempting to purify your shards so you'd better be prepared to fight if you're going to be playing any pvp so we have the area where you need to go to purify your shards purifying your shards gives them to you as a currency uh, which you're going to be able to spend which they talk about in just a second but it almost looked like in that area right there, everybody is kind of killing together when Ash says that other players will know that you are trying to purify your shards. This is clearly some type of mini event that happens. So you need to be able to defend yourself. We're actually in that same area we saw before again with the ore and what looks like a little bit of a chest as well. But the chest kind of has like special markings around it. I'm wondering if there are Field of Hatred special chests that also drop a ton of shards. But you're going and to have to literally you defend you yourself in the meantime. so that Once you can. Uh, hard, sorry, and Ash just said something important there. That you might lose some stuff in the meantime. So you're going to be losing things, your shards, the shards that you have collected. So being able to PvP other characters is a way of collecting the shards that they have collected. But it also hinges on the fact that killing players isn't the only way to get shards. Again, killing different monsters was dropping shards, opening up uh, ore veins was dropping shards. I assume that chest would drop shards as well. As opposed to it just being a PvP zone where you walk in and kill other players, it's a zone that you can do PvP in, which is very different, right? It's a zone, it has monsters, has chests, has poppables, has clickables, has events that give the shards as rewards, and then you need to be able to successfully PvP to survive long enough to cleanse them to get them as a currency. And Mike Rapora is going to touch on more what you can actually do with those, which I actually want to stop on as well, because there's something important to notice there. Once they've got the purified shards, they can take these, go back to nearby towns to sell them, and then use that to buy a whole bunch But this person is just walking in, presumably from doing PvP since they have their purified shards of hatred down here. They've picked up a bunch of random items like gems that look like two or three tiers up from what we've seen already. Random, uh, normal magic and rare items in ear from killing somebody, if you can see that right next to me, which is pretty cool. So with our 3000 shards that they have right here, looks like they can buy any one of these items with some pretty, uh, just a kind of random looking amounts of cost here but when we see them actually buy something they buy some random gloves and it turns out that they were magic gloves tells you what item you got they got bolting striders hand wraps of discharging but i kind of want to touch on what they're saying right here a place for and use that to buy a whole bunch of like interesting cosmetic items and rewards so they said they're able to buy a whole bunch of interesting cosmetics and rewards. And if you notice, the thing that they're buying right here is specifically not a cosmetic. Uh, so being able to do PvP looks like it is one of the other end game progressive pathways to be able to gain gear and progression gear wise for your character. I also noticed that it said requires level 37 to be able to purchase. Here I'm Wondering if that is just what is always seen or if there's literally a level requirement to participate in PvP as well, which would be kind of interesting and not completely out of the norm for systems that we see in other games here. For people who really love PvP and want to still get loot and still increase their character's power, if that's the way they want to play, they can. And then there we do get the clarification that PvP, the system, is not just meant for people to just like go and kill each other and kind of not care about it. It is a legitimate endgame system for gear progression and a way of generating a currency which can be used to empower your character, which is pretty interesting. It's pretty cool. I like the fact that PvP zones aren't just go there and kill other players. It's go there and survive other players as well, which gives it this kind of survival horror aesthetic to it which i'm a big fan of in a lot of different games so i like that direction that they've gone with it and then obviously i've seen a lot of people looking at this and saying is that mephisto is that mephisto is that mephisto this looks like a world boss to me in the crucible and fractured peaks i assume it is not mephisto uh, i would be kind of buck wild for mephisto to just be one of the world bosses but cool don't get me wrong but this is uh, another very cool looking uh, world boss for us to go fight. 
But yeah, that is everything that I was able to pick out in this Into the End Game little bit of a teaser trailer reveal. Uh, just wanted to nitpick some of the details that otherwise might have gotten lost and potentially give us some insight into more specifics of the direction that they're taking these end game progressive systems. So if you watch the video, and you got to this part and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't notice that thing or I didn't notice that thing. Let me know down in the comments. Or if you think I missed something, let me know down in the comments as well. I'm trying just like you to get as much information into my brain and into my veins as possible, because I'll be honest with you, I'm just kind of sitting here waiting for the game to come out. But I figured that little bit more in depth uh, might help some people get a bit more excited. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know it was a little bit interesting one, a little bit of a rambly one, but there was just so much cool stuff to kind of pick out. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you